I felt that I wanted to get that across to an audience who I, I know will appreciate it in principle, but to have contact face to face with it uh, brought it very much home and very much uh, alive to me. At about this time last year, possibly a little earlier, it became uh, patently clear that the United Kingdom was heading to lockdown. The Court of Protection is a, an incredibly paper-based court. It has an antediluvian technology system, and I was worried how on earth it was going to cope with the exigencies of a pandemic, which instinctively many of us, us felt would be at least six months. Unhappily, it proved to be rather longer even than that. Within days of what we call lockdown, and probably you all do too, uh, we moved on to the video conferencing platform. Um, I can't remember a more stressful time in my career. It wasn't the cases, <laughs> it was having to wet load an e-bundle and ask for it to be hyperlinked. I wouldn't have known what that meant in the week before. And ensuring that I wasn't muted and everybody else wasn't muted and we were getting to where we uh, needed to be was hugely stressful. And if that wasn't stressful enough, it was determined that there should be a transparency uh, project to look at how the Court of Protection was coping and achieving transparency in the time of the pandemic. That's a very noble objective, but I can tell you, it stressed out the judges to a level that you couldn't possibly begin to appreciate. Not least those at the uh, lower uh, tiers, the district judiciary, who don't have the kind of support staff I do to help me uh, make the links. Regularly in the Court of Protection, there have been 70 to 80 people on the video conferencing platform. We wouldn't have got anything like that if we'd been sitting uh, in a real courtroom. What became obvious to me right from the beginning is that something fairly dramatic had changed. Although we had just started lockdown, the NHS had been under pressure for some time already. That, of course, is why we went into lockdown, because there was an anxiety as to whether the NHS would cope. And suddenly, I started to hear evidence from doctors in hoodies and scrubs, no longer bow ties. By the way, I did have a doctor in a bow tie the other day, the only one in the pandemic. He was retired and had decided to dress up in his bedroom for the occasion. Um, <clears throat> And what soon became obvious is that the hypothesizing, the theorizing, the grandstanding, sometimes the defense of armor prop that we get from expert witnesses from time to time had evaporated all completely. What I was getting was something immensely refreshing. I was getting a doctor speaking like a doctor in a hospital with a doctor head on and not a witness head on. And the clarity of the evidence, the quality of the analysis, the uh, um, empathy of the doctors uh, with their patients was revealed to me in a way that it simply hasn't been for the previous 30 years. That is not in any way to, uh, to deprecate any of those doctors. They just were not standing in a pulpit in a neo-Gothic courtroom. They were in scrubs with their hoodie on, behaving like doctors. And they'd had to have uh, some fairly frank conversations with a lot of people. The sort of conversations that, um, as one of them put it to me, we should have been having all along. Open, simple, honest, real, evaluations of options rather than the tendency to hedge and use euphemism and perhaps to run away these were these were conversations about life and death about whether to go on the ventilator or not 
and they were taking place without family members being around in circumstances where families couldn't get there. Um, but that too generated a different dynamic between family who were brought in remotely to the conversations later and doctors and has created a kind of um, teamwork between patient and medical staff that the Court of Protection by its very nature arbitrating upon disputes doesn't often see. So I think uh, from a medical perspective, there has been something really quite um, important in what has happened in this dynamic and which has absolutely to be harnessed for the future. Um, doctors used to have to get the train down from wherever it was in the country to get to the uh, Royal Courts of Justice to wait, having a rather unappealing coffee here until the judge was ready. And that might be some time if an emergency came into the list. Too often, just before the doctor was about to be called, there was a sudden agreement about the doctor's evidence and he wasn't needed anymore. Well, imagine you can stay in the hospital and get on with your work and not have to come to the court at all. I have seen no diminishment in quality of evidence. On the contrary, as I've foreshadowed, I've seen an improved quality of evidence. And whereas in the past there's been a kind of presumption that doctors will attend in person to give evidence, given the gravity of the, gravity of the issues that they're talking about, I do not an anticipate that that presumption will arise in future. I've also uh, noticed something about the way uh, the cases have evolved. In the past, it was not possible for me to visit what we call P, the protected adult in the proceedings. Um, it simply is not possible for a judge to go up and down the country, particularly if, if somebody is in um, a state of diminished consciousness where there might appear to be little gain from doing so. But I have visited the protected person over the last 12 months more than I ever have done before. By which I mean, uh, if you add all the years I've been sitting and practicing together and compare it with this year, I've done more this year than all those years put together. I've found it to be incredibly illuminating, not least because as I have gone in with the nurse taking the video camera to the ICU or to the hospital bed, I've got a sense of the circumstances of the individual. The um, concept of intensive care, happily I have never been in the real world uh, anywhere near intensive care. And I realized why it is called intensive care, just how many people there are around the bed all the time. I could see, I'm bound to say, the exhaustion in their faces. But I had it made flesh to me what preservation of human dignity in those circumstances meant. Their care, their concern, their professionalism bestowed upon the individual they were caring for a kind of dignity. We talk about human dignity um, quite a lot in the Court of Protection. But over the past 12 months, I have watched human beings work proactively to promote and to preserve it. All sorts of things give themselves away. Sometimes when I go into the, the hospital, I find a family member there who probably should not be. I remember going to see one young boy and his brother was sitting by the bed and he wasn't expecting the High Court judge to arrive uh, even remotely. Indeed, I hadn't planned to at all until a few minutes before I went, I think at the suggestion of the official solicitor. And he felt slightly guilty at having been caught out going into hospital against what he thought the regulations were. Um, 
I couldn't have been more delighted, of course. Um, he told me that the nurses often let him sneak in. And although his brother was unlikely to be aware of his presence, he didn't want to take that chance. And he want, didn't want his brother to be alone in the final hours. Um, that is what conveys human beings at the end, their dignity, the love of family around them. Too frequently, that's not been possible. I see other little signs, teddy bears, football shirts, all sorts of um, little memorabilia, which the family think are important um, around the bed. And what I see uh, most frequently is the extent to which um, nurses have become a kind of substitute uh, family to the patients in, in the bed. They've been lauded properly, and I can add nothing to the real heroism that I have seen. But what all this means is that somehow in the pandemic, I've got better evidence. I've got better access to the individual at the center of it. And the third point, if I may, probably stretching a little beyond my time, is to say that <clears throat> when we started the um, planning for the uh, how the court was going to react to the pandemic, and I looked around at the um, miles of paper files in the court of protection, when I first was appointed, it was like going alive for Mars scenario. I didn't believe, I've not seen anything like this since I did an internship before I started in the law, but that's how, how it, still, it still was. Um, the, the asset we had was the people. The judges have worked incredibly hard. My court staff at uh, First Avenue House, the hub of uh, the court of protection, have come into court physically to distribute uh, paperwork to judges at home, risking their own health and often being really quite anxious. Um, I found it really moving when I have been to see them to see such um, dedication. And also the bar and the, the legal profession. We decided that if we were going to preserve transparency and with the help of the feedback that we were getting, every case would be opened briefly. Issues would be honed down even more rigorously than usual. And we would try and introduce a new style of advocacy right across the board before every judge not just the vice president. And we've achieved it. There has been a, a structure of advocacy which is noticeably different. There is a huge discipline in opening a case because it causes you to focus on the issues. And there is a discipline imposed by each of us knowing that we are in some way being watched and monitored and written about. Additionally, because there have been people furloughed, which is how we come to uh, have 70 or 80 people in on a regular basis, we've had professions from a whole range of uh, specialisms who have uh, written to me and to the Hive Group, um, the hub that we put together to, to run the pandemic, a kind of think tank, I think, um, and have um, said how much it has made real to them their understanding of what is involved in evaluating capacity. And one final thing, if I may, if I may be forgiven for boasting shamelessly on behalf of the Court of Protection, which I have the privilege to head, at tier three, the high court level, at tier two, the circuit level, and at tier one, the district judge level, there is not a single case in backlog as I speak to you now, not a single case. There is no court in the world that can boast that. 
And it is entirely down to the efforts of all those people, all of them, all of them involved, that we've been able to achieve that. I wouldn't have thought it possible. The antediluvian system remains in place. The paperwork is still there. I'll be going to have a look at it later this week. But something really quite remarkable has happened that we have to take forward. I've set up a subgroup of the Hive uh, group, which is going to look at, headed by the official solicitor, which is going to look at what we take forward from the pandemic. Now, I hope that's an encouraging story to you um, because we need a little bit of encouragement at the moment. Um, but it's, um, it's been a remarkable, exhausting journey. Um, I hope that we're beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I had my vaccine at the weekend. <laughs> John, I've gone over slightly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge. That was fascinating and, as we expected, insightful. And it is extraordinary for us to hear and learn from a senior member of the judiciary just what has changed, how effectively, in such a short uh, piece of time. Can I encourage anyone who's uh, on the platform to go on to Bailey, which you'll all be familiar with, and you will see Mr. Justice Hayden's judgments from the Family Division and the Court of Protection and you will see the careful, meticulous uh, decisions focused always on the child or the incapacitated adult, dealing with huge ethical, moral, difficult issues, but always filled with great humanity. And, and some of the judgments really are beautifully written and very moving, and I encourage you all to do that. The Commonwealth Lawyers Association requires members to keep these webinars going. So can I encourage any of you who are watching to please consider becoming a member and to consider coming to our conference. This sounds quite exotic, doesn't it? Come to our conference in Nassau in the Bahamas in September of this year. It is going ahead. We all need to meet. We're all missing seeing each other, having a cocktail or a cup of coffee. And we need to get off to some extent at webinars and platforms and start to see each other again. So I encourage you to please come to that conference. We now uh, turn to have um, experiences from lawyers in six Commonwealth jurisdictions to add to Mr. Justice Hayden's keynote remarks. Uh, and I'm going to ask them all to please speak for about five to eight minutes uh, from each of their jurisdictions. Their biographies are all on the information. I won't read out their biographies. Um, but they're all extremely talented senior lawyers in their respective Commonwealth jurisdictions. And we will, we will hope, I, have, I hope we will have a QA and a um, in about 40 minutes time. Uh, and you can put questions into the Q&A or the chat. And I will try and make sure I understand how to deal with that when we come to that stage. But first, as we go around the world, we will go to Eileen in Malaysia. Uh, thank you so much, John. Um, it was so lovely, I think, to listen to Mr. Justice Hayden start with such positivity. Um, it's been so much, you know, story, so many stories of sadness, of stress, of despair. I think to start an event with the positive things that have come out of this pandemic, I think is absolutely lovely. And I have to say, that's what I've been doing every day. I try and count my blessings. And one of the blessings that I'm counting for today is the fact that I'm sharing this platform with such eminent uh, uh, legal minds. We are gonna start with the least eminent and then I think we'll move on to the most, I suspect. Um, so uh, good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think we have people from all over the world. A shout out to my fellow Malaysians. I was told that many have signed on today. I do have a very short um, sort of slight presentation, which I'm going to share with you, just to take you through the Malaysian perspective. And we are talking about, I think, rationing healthcare in times of a global pandemic. So just very quickly, an overview of Malaysia, about 30 million in population, 61,000 doctors, 106,000 nurses, public hospitals, 145, private hospitals, 210. The majority of the uh, uh, population goes to the public hospitals, but we do have a significant visiting the private hospitals. I think quite different perhaps from the situation in the United Kingdom. The ICU capacity, um, this is based on the Ministry of Health uh, figures. 
for COVID-19 patients is at 871. The figures of COVID-19 uh, infected people in Malaysia, this is of yesterday. Uh, we had new cases, 1,208. Total confirmed cases over 300,000. We had 155 people in the ICU and total death today is over 1,200. And at its highest, we had 260 people in the ICU. So just now you saw that the capacity of the Malaysian ICU is over 800. So I think well within capacity from the figures released by the Ministry of Health. And if we look at the law, because this is what we're doing this, after, this evening, sorry, this evening in Malaysia at least. Um, in Malaysia, we have our federal constitution, that's our supreme law. We have legislation and we have judge-made law. Now, when I talk about rationing healthcare, pre-COVID, what was happening? It was already happening, of course. Doctors, healthcare providers had to make decisions. Uh, resources are, are never enough. So they had to make decisions and the decisions were made based on institutions. So each center would decide on its own. There, were no, there are no nationwide guidelines and doctors generally decide on outcomes, meaning the probability of survival. This is what I'm told. What then happened when COVID came? The practice continued basically because rationing is of course no stranger to the medical profession and the Malaysian doctors just continued uh, they don't have, we don't have protocols, we don't have national guidelines, so they continue as they were, I think, continuing from whatever their institutions had introduced before. Can't talk about rationing without mentioning Jeremy Bentham very quickly, <laughs> you all don't mind. We are looking at this greatest happiness of the greatest number, blah, blah, blah. But of course, the irony of it all, I think, is that it only works well. Uh, if you or your loved ones are not part of, of that greatest number, otherwise it doesn't work at all because you're not part of that greatest number. So I'm told at least that when witches or, or women, I, I, I picked this uh, specifically because a lot of women on the platform uh, today, burned at the state. One of the reasons was because it was thought at the time that uh, these women had, I think, caused diseases. So for the greater good, we had to burn these women at the state. But the practice of medicine, I believe, is predominantly egalitarian in nature. Doesn't have that, I think, aspect of utilitarianism. So how would the Malaysian courts approach? That's the question I ask myself when I'm told to speak uh, at this event. How would the Malaysian courts approach uh, issues relating to rationing healthcare? So I think the competing considerations in Malaysia would be, first, we look at our supreme law. We do have provisions in our constitution that talk about equality, uh, before the law, of course, uh, about the right to life, uh, of course. Uh, and these are, I think, the competing considerations that the judges would look at. These are obviously egalitarian, I think, concepts. In a recent decision in the federal court, um, I think it helped that Article 81, when we talk about equality or protection, uh, equal protection before the law, the federal court did decide that it is not absolute, of course, as long as there is a rational basis uh, for discrimination, then that is fine. It will not offend Article 81. And the concept or principle of intelligible differentia was adopted. Similarly, Article 51, right to life is again not absolute. It says there's a proviso safe in accordance with law. So what would that mean? I think it would mean the public law question is whether or not the rationing of healthcare in Malaysia during this pandemic would offend these egalitarian concepts that are embodied in our federal constitution. That would be the public law question. I do think, however, given the sort of uh, absence of national uh, protocols or guidelines or even directions relating to rationing healthcare, it will be, I think, mainly a private law issue in Malaysia, if it comes to that. So the question I think will be, down the road, yes, we all know talk, talk about the pandemic, we all know talk about rationing healthcare, but down the road, two, three years down the road, if a case is to be brought against a practitioner, probably the question will be for the courts to look at whether or not the, that rationing uh, would afford a reasonable defense to a claim in negligence. And the test for negligence in Malaysia is the Bolan test, 
for diagnosis and treatment and the Rogers and Whitaker test for advice of risk. I'm not going to answer the question. We're going to have a lovely discussion, I'm sure, uh, but I'm going to put the question out there. I'm going to end with this slide. I think we're all going to get our vaccination because we all want to travel. So please visit Malaysia when you can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arlene. That was wonderful. Without any further delay, we'll now go all the way across the world to Canada to Laurie, please. You're on mute, Laurie. You're still on mute, Laurie. We're still learning. <laughs> okay, unmuted. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure to be here to share the panel with uh, my fellow panelists and uh, to reach out as far as we are this morning around the world. Well, it's morning here in Canada, 8 a.m. So let me just jump in. Uh, first, uh, I'm just going to touch very briefly on the legal context in Canada, our experience of COVID. I will touch on two issues specific to the rationing question and tie up hopefully with uh, a lesson learned. So by way of legal context, just very briefly, Canada is a federal state. Uh, we have a national government, uh, federal government at the national level. Uh, the, the country is divided into 10 uh, provinces, two territories with governments at that level. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, legislative competence over health care is a matter of shared jurisdiction. But practically speaking, mo most health care delivery and the regulation of health care delivery happens at the provincial and territorial level, whereas federal involvement relates to setting broad parameters uh, for health system delivery. Our constitution includes a charter of rights and freedoms, uh, which applies to government action at both levels. There is no specific protection directed at access to healthcare, but certainly there are provisions that have been interpreted to provide important protections uh, in the healthcare context, uh, mainly section seven, which is our right to life, liberty and security of the person and the equality provision in section 15. So just to touch very briefly on the Canadian experience of COVID, uh, it has varied across the country. So we have uh, at the Eastern side of the country four Atlantic provinces that uh, really have performed extraordinarily well. Um, they basically walled themselves off early in the epidemic uh, or a pandemic rather, and created their own bubble and maintained that approach with strict quarantine requirements to enter and leave the bubble. And as a result, relative to population have very low uh, case counts and death counts. Our indigenous communities in the north have been a source of uh, real concern from the outset of the pandemic, uh, but almost miraculously uh, relatively spared. Um, their remoteness has probably been a source of protection. There have been a small number of outbreaks, but not the level of devastation uh, that was feared given very high rates of underlying chronic health conditions and also very limited access to health care in some of the most remote and fly-in communities. So the balance of the country then is on a spectrum, some better, uh, some worse, but uh, sharing a common experience uh, and that being that the first wave managed, I think we all felt fairly well uh, but the second wave has been much longer and deeper than uh, was perhaps expected with uh, case counts about seven times uh, what they were at their highest peak compared with the first wave. And we now find, find ourselves on the precipice of a third wave um, with the uh, having brought the so-called wild virus more or less under control, but now facing uh, quite rapid spread of what are called here the variants of concern, uh, primarily the UK variant, the South American variant, and uh, South African rather, and Brazilian. 
And we are facing that at the same time as our vaccination program is uh, unrolling, but uh, rolling out with some organizational problems and limitations on supplies. So the fear is that uh, the vaccination program will not be sufficiently underway uh, to protect against this third wave, which uh, in Ontario at least is anticipated to bring even higher uh, case numbers potentially than the second wave. So turning to the question of the rationing of healthcare, there were just two points I wanted to highlight uh, very briefly. The first is that early in the pandemic, we did have, uh, uh, there. Ha I guess I will say by way of uh, introduction, there has not been a lot of activity in the courts in the healthcare context. Uh, one case I can talk about is a case that involved an application for an interim injunction, injunction brought by nurses in four different long-term care facilities around the province. Uh, they were all homes that were in outbreak with significant numbers of uh, resident and staff infections and significant numbers of resident deaths. And the main issues in dispute was that the employers were in effect rationing access to PPE and not providing uh, the nurses with point of care, uh, the point, the ability to determine what PPE they required at point of care. And so the, uh, the nurses had all, these were unionized environments, the nurses had grieved uh, the employer's actions, but pending final determination of that issue brought an application for an interim injunction. And the, um, uh, the injunction was uh, ultimately successful. Uh, the application succeeded in a fairly specific legislative framework in that uh, the nurses were grieving the failure of the employers to follow through on mandatory directives that have been issued by our Chief Medical Officer of Health. Uh, in the context of the decision, the court emphasized the importance of the precautionary principle, uh, which is embedded in our provincial public health legislation, um, not, uh, well, it's embedded expressly with reference to occupational health and safety provisions and uh, arguably implicitly elsewhere in uh, other statutory authorities provided uh, by the legislation. But the court certainly highlighted that as an important principle. Um, there was fleeting reference to a charter argument, but that ultimately was not pursued. So that was an interesting example of, um, uh, of uh, healthcare staff taking issue with rationing of PPE, which was very much a concern at the outset of the pandemic, I think not just in Canada, but elsewhere uh, in the world. And so the last uh, point that I will touch on is um, relates to critical care uh, decision-making. So we have not seen uh, activity in the courts uh, as relates to rationing of healthcare. Um, Looking at access to healthcare, broadly speaking, uh, basically, I think, and this is a personal impression, really nothing more, but uh, you know, the population uh, has taken on board the notion that we really do need to preserve capacity within the system for those who are most ill, and so have accepted really as an unavoidable consequence of the pandemic, uh, a very early shutdown of the hospital, and then subsequently um, a level of uh, triage in terms of accessing surgical procedures and the like. Um, the critical care system has been operating throughout the second wave really over capacity. So we have crossed the threshold. Uh, we crossed the threshold in November uh, that uh, the, the threshold beyond which uh, business cannot carry on as normal in our hospitals. So we do have an accumulating 
a backlog of surgical procedures that is estimated uh, may take up to two years to clear in Ontario. Um, we do have the, um, in Ontario, a policy has been delivered to try and provide uh, structured guidance around uh, decision-making in the context of, a, of a, um, an overwhelming level of demand. We have not reached that level, so the system is managing to triage by putting off uh, delaying non-urgent procedures. Uh, in January, there were, there were efforts to, um, patients were being diverted, uh, but we have not reached the point at which, um, we have not ever reached the point at which uh, ventilators and ICU capacity is being rationed. But there is a policy framework that has been developed uh, by the Ministry of Health and circulated. Uh, it has come under some criticism for the lack of public inter, uh, input and accountability, uh, concerns about the use of tools uh, as relates to uh, protecting uh, those with disabilities and concern about the potential for discrimination. Uh, there is concern about the lack of uh, any process to allow patients to challenge decision-making. And uh, there is some underlying concern that uh, it, we will see an emergency order at the last minute uh, suspending uh, patient entitlements to uh, in, um, the, uh, under our Healthcare Consent Act to uh, exercise informed consent uh, to decisions about healthcare, including the uh, decision to withhold treatment, which our Supreme Court has ruled is uh, part of uh, it is a treatment that engages the obligation to secure informed consent. Laurie, so, Laurie thank, thank you. I'm just going to interject. We probably need to um, move on. Short time scale for each speaker. Um, and uh, if you just maybe would wrap up now and then we'll go to Lauren in Scotland. Yes, I was just going to say the, uh, in terms of lessons learned, I think that uh, a big one here has been the interconnectedness of our individual and public healthcare systems. So we have seen decisions about um, opening up broad access to COVID-19 testing as a matter of individual access to care, uh, undermine public health interventions aimed at the broader, protecting the broader population. And similarly, uh, or conversely, the failure to control the pandemic has had massive impacts on individuals' ability to access care. Laurie, thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating. You're welcome. Good to hear quite a positive response in Canada. Lauren, let, let's hear about the, the Scottish situation. And some viewers might be thinking, uh, Scotland's part of the United Kingdom. We have um, a number of speakers from that jurisdiction. But of course, Scotland has a completely separate legal system, um, although there are some overlaps in the area of medical law. So Lauren, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. Thank you uh, for asking me to speak uh, today. When John first contacted me about this event, I thought it's fabulous, but I was unsure. Um, normally, the Scottish solicitors are, are not present at these kind of events, and I wasn't sure if I could bring anything uh, positive or useful uh, to the event. Um, in Scotland, we don't have it. Sadly, we don't have a court protection. Um, we do have judicial review for resource allocation challenges, and I've been involved in in, in, in those things, and also in uh, cases uh, based on system failures and failures to provide drugs, which we brought at common law. Um, I've, ha I've had a lot of contact during uh, COVID. We've had nurses complaining and doctors lack of PPE. Uh, one of the major things we've been looking at is transfer of um, patients from um, hospital facilities uh, who are COVID positive to care homes, uh, which then cause um, outbreaks within the care homes and one other major issue which I found extremely Sorry, just I'm sorry, is it? Um, okay. um, maybe Laurie you could mute please. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, Thank you. And we're also, um, we've had a lot of issues and this is extremely concerning in relation to DNAR orders 
um, which uh, where GPs have been completing such orders without discussion with family members at all. And, and this is one of the, the, the continuing concerns. But one of the things I thought I could uh, bring to this meeting uh, in this, the brief time that I have is that I have been working for the last year um, with uh, doctors and in particular doctors who work in intensive care. Um, and one of the issues that concerned them, and I've watched this evolve and the stress that they have been under, um, is the lack of um, a national policy in the UK. Now, our healthcare is devolved, I, I accept that in Scotland, but we were interested in a national policy. And the reason that we wanted um, a national policy really was for protection, not just of the, the clinicians that we ask to go and be there in the front line, but also to, um, I'm very into uh, candor and information disclosure and um, you, you involving patients and families in decision making. And uh, this to me felt that the, the people were being um, filtered, information was being filtered about what was really going to be there or not there with a view that there would be perhaps huge concern. So because time is limited, what I thought to do was to perhaps highlight the issues that I've been facing and the medical professionals that I've been working with in the last year. Uh, and I have to say, there was many times that I felt full of despair uh, when you see the reality of what was going on. Now, the, front, the reality was that frontline health professionals, particularly our ITU doctors, and I have been, I have seen someone in ITU, and I know the standard of care that's given there, um, they were placed in a position where they were having to make difficult resource um, decisions, sometimes in the middle of the night in an emergency basis, and they're entirely unsupported. And, and I do not find that to be acceptable when we ask them to, to go into this front line. They should not be left on their own to make decisions. Triage is the issue. Triage prioritization of patients was clearly a big issue that needed to be addressed, withdrawal of care, but we had no national triage guidance produced by the government. Medics were saying to me that they were concerned um, if they removed a patient from a ventilator or refused access to a ventilator, this could lead to criminal charges or complaints. Um, many uh, doctors required to make these triage decisions um, with COVID patients, but also they had a situation where they had non-COVID patients and who gets that ventilator, who gets the treatment? And there was also a concern that was being raised that doctors in practice were making decisions based on an anticipation of resource limitations before there was actually a resource problem or before there was an issue with access to ventilators. Now that's something that perhaps was unconscious, but doc the, these doctors at the start of this pandemic recognized that there potentially was going to be a huge issue and it needed to be addressed. And this is why patients were being transferred from hospitals out to other facilities or home. There was also issues that if people were being transferred um, to, to home too early, would that then lead to a claim against them if something went wrong when they were transferred home? Or when someone attended accident and emergency, do they admit them to a hospital where they may get COVID or send them home? And in each situation, they, there was a feeling of vulnerability. Candor uh, I, is something in Scotland, I'm extremely proud to say that we do have a le legal duty of candor. We also have an apologies bill, which um, I, I, I wholly endorse. And of course, I am really behind the issue of um, information disclosure to patients because of my involvement in Montgomery. Um, it was had been suggested that doctors no longer needed to apply Montgomery principles um, in, a, in a pandemic. Why, why would that be the case? Um, but that was seriously being suggested. But again, this put medical professions, in, in my opinion, in an extremely difficult position with an uninformed public and members of the public who believed that they have a healthcare system which is free at the point of delivery and will always be there for them. Um, now, the question as well was, um, what about the, these DNER, CPR orders, which were, were started with older people, vulnerable people, and I understand also people with disabilities. 
And was that done, um, the, the instructions to do it, was that done because it was removing a population um, from access to resources that may be limited? And uh, that must be a concern. And, and I wondered that what was starting to happen was a lot of um, principles that we held dear were allowed to become lax because we were in a pandemic. Now, there was, it's not the situation that there was no guidance in the UK uh, at all, but sometimes the reality is that when many different guidance is produced, we then have conflicts, we have different things being said, and how are these doctors supposed to um, work out which one do we read, which one do we follow? And some of them were referring to the, the other guidance. So we had GMC guidance on prioritizing access to treatment. We had NICE guidance, um, on critical care, and they had a, they originally had a, what they used as a, a critical frailty score or scale that was immediately challenged because it didn't respect the rights of disabled, particularly um, the, those with autism and learning disabilities. Um, so th that that did not help. And um, Nice talks about triage and prioritising of patients. And the Royal College of Physicians also publish ethical dimensions in COVID for frontline staff, supported by 14 colleges in the Royal College. No reference to prioritising of care. And uh, they did involve the multidisciplinary approach and prioritising of beds allocated in an appropriate assessment process. Difficult again, what's the criteria? So uh, the Royal College of Surgeons, the BMA, produced ex excellent guidance and identified a public acceptance of rationing decisions. Um, the Royal College of Nurses also got involved and uh, the, Resusc the Resuscitation Council of the BMA, the BMJ were involved. But what we never had, and we, we, we need to think about, I see, is we did not have national guidance. So although trusts could produce and individual hospitals could produce guidance, um, the, the situation was that the uniform, uniformity was not guaranteed. And interestingly, I did look in detail at the uh, Italy's a guidance produced by the College of Anesthesia uh, and uh, Resuscitation Intensive Care. And they, they did grasp that thorny nettle of, and um, they said intensive care should be prioritized for those whom there is a greater chance of success and for whom there is uh, the greatest life expectancy. They also recognized, they said there may be an, have to be an upper age limit. They also said access to ITU beds should not necessarily be on a first come first serve basis. He said patients well, Lauren, should undo. Lauren, could I ask you please just to um, wrap things up so we can get um, to Nigeria and then back to London. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, thank you, John. I, sorry, I had, I've had a timer on, but I, I've not looked at it. Um, Sydney and Australia produced some great guidance as well. And, and the Australians have done some great work that if people want to look at that, because I think what to wrap up what we're doing now is surely we want to focus on what did we learn from this year and what, and what do we need to do to approach, uh, to improve our approach? Should we be placed in this situation again? And um, I think first and foremost, we need to say that we want to protect our professionals who have to make these decisions uh, and give them a structure. But we also need to educate the public because there is a view that public acceptance of rational decisions is more likely if they are informed and the decisions are seen to be uh, open and fair and understandable. And with that, thank you. Lauren, thank you. I mean, that's an absolutely fascinating uh, discussion about an issue which I've been advising on. Why is it the national guidance for doctors? Why do individual trusts have to produce their own policies? It seems odd, um, but there we go. Yeah. Um, I have written. I have written to the government because uh, there's no point in sitting moaning about something and then not doing anything. And I have written uh, and emailed, and I've not had an answer. Interesting. Thank you, Lauren. That was fascinating. So from Edinburgh, we go to Laolu in Nigeria. Now, Laolu, you are the vice president of the World Association for Medical Law. So it may well be you have a fairly wide ranging view. Um, I'm going to ask you, Laolu and Fiona, to speak for only five minutes. Sorry, just because we're, we're running out of time a bit. And I do want to have a bit of a discussion at the end. So just for five minutes, Laolu, over to you, please. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you, John. Um... I'll be speaking from perspective of um, the developing nations. Um, most of the developing nations have certain things in common, one of which is um, the fact that um, 
the budget for health is less than 5%. Um, we in Nigeria, um, for, for um, even before COVID, rationing, we've used to the system of um, ration because of the lack of um, adequate funding for the health system. Um, so we've had to use um, virtually a national policy of triage where we um, try to not encourage certain um, tertiary facilities to handle um, um, ailments that could be handled in primary or secondary facilities in order for us not to clog up the system. Unfortunately, that still pervades anyway. Um, with respect to Nigeria, we've also had another developing countries aside from uh, in terms of ICUs and critical care centers, um, we've also had the, 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 the scarcity of manpower and, um, and, and, um, and, and intensivists, for example, are quite scarce in the country. Um, we look at the population of um, 200 million Nigerians and um, we have a ratio of um, 36 doctors to 1,600 patients. So in such instance, you find out that um, the system is overstretched already. So um, the, the triage has always been in place, but with COVID, we've been quite lucky here because we've had um, um, only 1,460,000 infections out of population of 200 million, and we've had about 2,000 deaths. So we've not really had, um, um, particularly had the, the, the pressure on ICUs here. Uh, because we've not had much demand for ICUs in Nigeria, surprisingly so. Um, but at the same time, too, we've had challenges with, um, with, with, this, with, this, with the structure in place with respect to um, the demand for personal and uh, stretched um, facilities. And at times, we have challenges with beds. Um, so we have instances where, the, aside from it being a statewide policy of triage, you find out that the 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 times has also do better triage in deciding, for example, who gets certain treatments and and who unfortunately doesn't get. Particularly if um, uh, the, the the patient is unfortunate to have very poor prognosis or um, is elderly and um, the the likelihood of um, recovery is is quite slim or minimal. You know, you have instances where the the healthcare provider will have to triage and um, you know move on. So we've had such instances in Nigeria, but um, at the same time too, we are also quite lucky with the pandemic because we have a huge youth population in the country. So we've had a lot of people who probably have uh, have contacted COVID without even knowing. Um, they are these asymptomatic persons who are walking free around the country without even showing um, um, symptoms of COVID because we've had, um, we have a huge population of youths. So what we tried to do was to um, try and enlighten the elderly people and those who have pre-existing conditions to stay largely indoors. We did have lockdown here. We did have um, a second spike, um, but we've been quite lucky. And I believe uh, the luck has to do essentially with the youth population of Nigerians and, um, and the fact that um, the elderly people we have, you know, we have adequately counsel to remain indoors and minimize um, um, outdoor events uh, as much as possible, you know, and those with pre-existing conditions as well. It is, we were quite lucky here, like I said, because um, if the, uh, if what has happened in the, in the advanced countries was happening here, where people had to depend ext extensively on, on ICUs and intensivists, um, we would have had a really, really big challenge on our hands here. Um, we ration in as well now, even with the with the vaccines coming up now, we are forced to ration, first of all, by giving the frontline workers and giving, um, you know, doctors and um, nurses um, being their priority. Um, we also try to ration with PPEs as well, you know, so we try to, while rationing that as well, we try to make people here have customized face masks in order for um, private individuals not to purchase the surgical uh, face mask to the detriment of healthcare workers. Um, so it is unlike in other climes, it is a familiar terrain 
we've always been able to operate in a system of scarcity. So to the extent that even training of our health workers, most of them were trained, you know, with, um, with, with the mindset that things will be scarce. Um, you know, I guess when things get better, we'll have to be trained to surplus. But we've not really had the experience in several years of working with surplus. So our healthcare workers have been quite trained in huge challenges in the environment. And, um, you know, so that has also given us a bit of um, an advantage because um, we were easily able to adapt to what COVID brought. You know, um, I think my five minutes is up. Laura, that, it is up, but thank you so yes. much. That was very interesting to hear how the healthcare system, which operates on the basis of having to ration, is possibly better prepared, more experienced in dealing with the challenges of the pandemic. So it's a very interesting perspective. Thank you very much. Now, having run around the world, we come back to Fiona in London. Thank you. Right. And thank you to everyone for their for their talks. I'm going to follow up from a lot of what Lauren said, but in fact, taking into account of things that Eileen, Laurie and Lolu have also said in respect of the approach of England, and I'm going to talk specifically about England, not Wales, not Scotland, Northern Ireland, in the way that um, rationing has or hasn't taken place. As you know, we have had in this country some of the worst rates of COVID in the world. Um, there are approximately 125,000 people who have died in the past year within 28 days of a receipt of a COVID positive test. And at its worst, in January, we had over 40,000 people in hospital. Um, it has been the greatest crisis for the National Health Service, I suspect, since its inception and has been the greatest test for us as a nation since the Second World War. And it is really only because of the heroic professionalism of the, all of those who work in the NHS, from those who clean the floors, to those who manage, to those who provide clinical care, that the system has not entirely fallen over. But does that mean that rationing has taken place? Yes. English law allows there to be rationing to healthcare. Whilst we have a national health service, which is the closest thing to a religion, as lots of people say, in secular English society, the courts and the law do permit rationing of services. And there have been a series of cases over the years about um, sometimes the most heartbreaking cases, for example, about children who will otherwise die if they don't receive various forms of treatment. And the courts have consistently said that whilst the NHS under the, re under the relevant English legislation has a duty to promote um, a national health service, it is not under an absolute duty to provide treatment in all circumstances. So what happened at the beginning of the pandemic, as Lauren has identified, was a number of professional bodies came together and produced guidance, which in effect made what Aileen talked about, which is the rationing system, clear. And for clinicians at least, basically identified that there may be circumstances in which some people would get priority over others, I think I'm thinking in particular, as um, Lauren's already said, there was um, the Royal College of Physician guidance, but I think the most extensive guidance was produced by the BMA, which is the doctor's trade union here in, in the United Kingdom, which made it clear that there would need to be triage decisions and there would need to be decisions at later stages, which would be based upon somebody's ability to benefit from that kind of system. Now, at the beginning, as Lauren said, NICE produced guidance and it has produced guidance and it still has guidance now. NICE is a body, a, an NHS body, which in effect um, is meant to provide consistent guidance as to what you do, what treatment you provide and when. That um, simply refers to all the relevant BMA guidance and the Royal College of Physician guidance as to how decision making should take place. What didn't happen, as obviously has happened in Australia and other countries, is there has been no national guidance issued by the government as to how um, treatment should be rationed. 
Um, and there has been a challenge to that, which a decision was made um, about three weeks ago, where the court said that that challenge didn't even get permission. So it didn't even pass the threshold to get further on the basis that it was entirely up to the government what it chose to provide guidance on and what it didn't choose to provide guidance on. And there was no rational basis upon which it could be held to be wrong not to produce guidance. Um, there are there have also been challenges to vaccination rollout. As you know, although we've had an, um, an immense crisis, we also have some of the best vaccination rates in the world. But there have been considerable concerns about who gets what priority. Again, the courts have not been interested in hearing those constraints and concerns, believing that the allocation of resources is best left to the clinicians to make individual decisions. Now, whilst that gives clinicians freedom of action, what it also means is potential inconsistencies. And one of the things that people have been concerned about is whether or not there has been indirect discrimination in the access to health care from those from ethnic minorities who have died in significantly greater numbers per head of population than the white population in this country and whether or not there has been um, indirect discrimination against those with learning disabilities or those who are very elderly assuming that their lives are not as valuable as others. Now the BMA guidance and we also have the Equality Act in this country which protects those with disabilities and those who are elderly from discrimination um, should mean that decisions are not made on that basis but the difficulty with not having any national guidance and not having clarity as Lauren said these decisions were being made and are being made on an individual basis it means you can't ever really tell and one of the things that a potential public inquiry I suspect will look at is whether or not there should have been because there's talk in the UK of having what's known as a public inquiry, which is where you dig down and you try and work out what the problems are and how we can stop them for the future, is whether or not there did need to be a greater acceptance. And the government did need, in fact, to say upfront, look, we are going to have to ration healthcare. This does mean that your mum, your dad, your brother, your sister might not get to go on a ventilator if we don't have enough. And um, Jenna, um, yeah. I think you're five minutes. Uh, okay, uh, I'm sorry, but um, it, that will be a challenge for the next time round. If and let's hope not, there is another wave of this pandemic. Thank you. Um, I mean, two very interesting points coming out of Fiona's uh, contributions. There, one is healthcare inequality, uh, and we don't yet know where we are. But I have some very grave concerns about um, the the fact that far too many people have died from certain sectors of society. Uh, and I think that's an issue that will have to be looked at very carefully, which feeds into Fiona's second point, inquiries. Um, it does seem that it's quite likely there might be a public inquiry in England and Wales. I, I wonder whether other Commonwealth countries who have experienced similar difficulties will be thinking about inquiries to inform the lessons that are learned. Can I thank you all very, very much, Mr. Justice Hayden and our five fabulous lawyers from around the world for those uh, extremely interesting contributions. We've got five minutes for some questions uh, and there's some in the Q&A box. Um, without starting you, Laurie, maybe I'll start with you. Addy has asked a question. Who will be held responsible if any patient waiting for a deferred surgical procedure passes away? Well, I think the, uh, it's an interesting question that to me uh, points to one of the um, really fascinating legal questions that will be maybe our fourth wave in COVID, which is uh, how do you determine in Canada under our common law, and I suspect elsewhere, the issue is uh, a critical issue in medical negligence cases is uh, whether there was compliance with accepted standards of practice. How will uh, standards of practice be impacted by the fact of the pandemic? 
and whether other decision maker, you know, ordinarily here, the, um, the physician would be the person responsible uh, for, you know, physicians involved in, in uh, delayed access would be the primary defendants, but you can readily imagine that uh, to the extent that hospital policy or government policy have uh, played into this, that they may be brought into uh, the line as well. Thank you, Laurie. Um, we have another question from Lydia, which I asked one panelist to volunteer to answer. It is, how can medical resources be allocated fairly during a COVID-19 pandemic? What happens if there are really no laws on the ground to ensure the protection of this right? Well, I'll answer it if nobody else will. Um, the reality is, is it isn't that there are no laws, it's just there are no laws which are written down. Um, doctors have to comply with their ethical guidelines. If they act in breach of their ethical guidelines in any country in the world, they will be subject to professional discipline. Um, there are general co common law in those countries which exercise common law jurisdictions, there are general common law jurisdictions in most of the countries in the world bar ours, Lauren and ours, there is a written constitution, which usually provides for equality before the law at the very least, and often provides for some kind of base level. But the reality is, is that I don't think there is any country in the world which provides a guarantee of medical treatment. They all Thank say we're going to try to, but none of them actually do it. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, I was emailed a question earlier, and I'm going to ask Laolo to answer it, please, briefly. Laolo, Courage Emavon says, um, what are the challenges in achieving a robust and effective healthcare in a global pandemic situation, given the poor state of healthcare facilities and resources in developing nations? Well, yeah, interesting question. Um, the only way out is, is for the governments in developing nations to prioritize health, to triage health um, and pump, um, allocate more resources from their budget allocations to health. Um, once that is done, I believe that um, they'll be further prepared for instances such as this. Um, some of us are lucky that we're, we're coming out a bit out of COVID, but it, nothing says tomorrow that something else will come out. So it's imperative for, for developing countries to, to focus and prioritize health and add more funding to health. The fact that majority of them have less than 5%, 5% of their budget allocated for, for, for health, it sh shows clearly where their priorities lie. You know, so it has to, they must have a quantum leap in the budget allocation for health. I think that's basically it. Laona, thank you very much. There are some other questions which we haven't got round to, to answer. I'm sorry about that, but I think we're nearly out of time. And I had one um, question for Mr. Justice Hayden, if he's prepared to answer it, which is over the last 12 months, um, standing back from all the court of protection and family division cases, has there been an, a, a concern or a feeling of inequality in respect of the cases that have been determined? Um, as far as ICU is concerned, I don't believe it has in England been under threat. It got quite close a few weeks ago, scarily close. And the figures in the United Kingdom are horrendous, as everybody knows. But in terms of the ICU resource, that hasn't come under pressure. What I do find very troubling is, as has already been touched upon, uh, the, the significantly elevated numbers of uh, black and ethnic minorities amongst those who have become seriously ill and died. And now, ironically and more challengingly, even more challengingly, the resistance within those communities to the vaccine. Um, this presents a, a, a very significant challenge for a judge when you get a son, for example, in one of the recent cases, it's on, on Bailey, who comes along and says um, he doesn't think it's in his mother's best interests and, and garners the arguments that are uh, around the world, sometimes for reasons which are not 
easy to understand, expressed by those who one would not expect to be expressing them. I'm sorry if that's a bit Delphic, but you know what I mean. And uh, you then find that the, the mother in the care home has always had the flu vaccine for the last few years, is, is quite a, is quite a, a old fashioned in her respectful view of Dr. Knows Best. And you evaluate that against the son's genuinely held beliefs that this, we should wait a little bit longer until we know whether it's a problem or not and try and get best interests. The preponderant evidence is, if you look at our awful figures and how they have dropped dramatically since the vaccine has been rolled out, um, the, the powerful, compelling evidence is that the vaccination seems to be working. Touch wood and for now. And um, I think there's a, an obligation, con uh, very conscious that I'm uh, addressing an international audience. There's an obligation on us to recognise the reality of the advantages of the vaccine and to make that clear at every opportunity we have to whoever we can. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, John, you never answer mine, so I don't see why. <laughs> <laughs> I shall bear that in mind, Judge. Thank you very much. Um, but that's a very encouraging note to end on, uh, that challenge that vaccination is undoubtedly a way out of this pandemic. It will reduce the pressures and demands on healthcare. Uh, and we must take that message out to our communities and our brothers and sisters in the Commonwealth. So may I thank Mr. Justice Hayden, Lauren, Laurie, Eileen and Laola for their contributions. May I thank the Secretariat, Bridget and Claire for all their hard work in putting on this webinar. I hope it's been interesting and I thank you all very much for your time and that brings the webinar to an end. Thank you.